thing I have to explain because it could be announced because Twitter was full of like, well, is he going to tell us the title or is he not? It was actually, uh, I'm very bad at preparing or sending my talks to conferences because I write them on the way to the conference. So, uh, when Vitaly was poking me three, four times what my, what my talk is going to be about, and <laughs> Mark actually sent me the heat map of the Smashing Conf website and showed me that hundreds of people had clicked on the not link that said to be announced. I just thought it's a good idea to call the, to call the presentation that, so that's the title of the presentation. And it's also the meaning of the presentation, because I found the last two days we learned a lot of stuff, and I'm actually on the forefront of information on the web development scene, because it's my job. And I'm talking to a lot of people in other companies and with other browsers. I work for Mozilla, so I can do that without having to sign an NDA and these kind of things. And there's this gloom and annoyance, and everybody says all the time that the web is not getting there anymore, and we're losing market. And I just wanted to talk about about this, what we're doing wrong, and what we could do better, and a few of these things that get people very annoyed about the web that they're just not true. And I think there's a preconception in developers that we always think when we look at something, we, we look for the flaws first. And I found that myself doing that all the time with software. But actually this morning I found myself even, even better here. You might, you might have seen these things outside, like the booking.com things that they have on the table. And I looked at them and I was like, who in 2012 gives out mouse mats? And then I looked at them and like, oh, these are actually fiber things that you can clean your mobile phone with. So Actually, I use them now, and now my mobile phone has much better resolution, and the colors are bright, and I can see things, and I thought I had applied blur filters, but I actually didn't. <laughs> so, the other thing that I find, that sometimes I feel incredibly stupid these days. I've written six books on web development stuff, and I've been in JavaScript since 97, I've done a lot of CSS. Nowadays, when people ask me, do you know CSS, I say, I know Leah, ask her. She knows more than me anyways. But I just get it, go to these JavaScript meetups and all people talk about is like MVC frameworks and Backbone and this node server and this thing and I have no idea what they're talking about. And I'm just standing there like, yeah, is it over for me? Should I just do something else? Like goat farming maybe? <laughs> and the problem I have with that is that I'm not good with outdoors and I don't like goats much, so no. But there is this doom and gloom message of people that go up and say like, oh yeah, the web is dead and we got to do something with the web because we're losing all these new hires that come from universities. They go to iOS and Android and they don't want to use the web. And we're, we're just going to be old grumpy people in half a year's time in the corner talking about things that nobody else cares about. Which is confusing to me because to me things are looking up. I'm just seeing things every day, and uh, I think a few of you follow me on Twitter, and in between the swearing and the pictures of animals, I find all these really cool technical things every single day. I mean, just today, somebody uh, found out the new iPhone 5 website and used developer tools to find out how Apple actually uh, uh, optimizes their videos and everything. So Apple and other companies are very open about that technology, I've heard. And it's quite amazing that somebody can just go on the web and look at all these details and find all the things just by playing with the technology. And these kind of things get me incredibly excited. And I see more and more cool new things coming up every day. I see talent like Brad coming out of nowhere. I see people like Leah all of a sudden showing me things in CSS I've never seen before. And other people just tell me like the web is dead and we gotta do something, we gotta replace it with other languages and widget frameworks and stuff because it's not gonna work, we're not gonna get new hires from universities. So where is that disconnect? Where does that come from? I mean, this is always fascinating me that on one hand I have people that are in the same position that I have, that have the same job, that basically wanna replace the web and me just getting excited that the web gets better and better every year. And I think the disconnect is partly shiny things. When you, when you live in a Silicon Valley or you live in an area where people are very connected and always have the newest, coolest stuff and have lots of money to, to spend on new shiny things, you really think that this is the new world, that somebody who hasn't got an iPhone is basically not part of society any longer or shouldn't be online. And being offline is this thing that never ever happens. And you like go to a conference, you will see you're offline a lot of times. 
And we get far too excited about the numbers of, uh, of smartphones and the numbers of tablets that are being sold and think this is actually the world outside there. And the pace of innovation is amazing as well. Like every, new, every month a new thing comes out and that's the end of the old thing. I mean, people get these new iPhones and then they're like, oh, the old one, oh, that's not good anymore. And half a year ago, they were really excited about the other one and said, that's the end of innovation. They've done everything now. And uh, there's actually quite a wonderful disconnect about this, and I hope this is going to work with sound. There's a video where they actually went out to an Apple store, uh, or just into a shopping mall, and gave people an iPhone 4S, and told them that's the iPhone 5. And asked them what their idea is, and what they think of it, and this is what came out of that. The new iPhone 5 just came out today. We want to know if you'll take a look at it. Tell us how it compares to the last iPhone. I love it. Oh, it's way better. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not way better. It's a little bit bigger. Looks like the screen's a little bigger. It seems a little bit faster. Yeah. Faster, lighter. It looks a lot heavier. Feels heavier? I think it's a lot lighter than the last one. It's a lot faster as well. It's going to take forever. Does one fast? Yeah, definitely faster. Right on. Oh, it's very nice. Very nice, very updated. Oh, it feels a lot lighter and just more on. It's not high quality, it's got a lot of drop. It's not like a 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 drop. It's not And this is incredible. I mean, of course, I used to work for the radio and interview people on the street where you push a microphone in their face and they say whatever. And you can actually cut it together and get the most random ones as well. But this is this suspense of disbelief that is happening in people. They just hear it in the news and then it has to be that way. And we believe that as developers as well. I, made this, I did this survey where I asked people what kind of JavaScript libraries they use and then what kind of if they support Firefox or not. And if they don't support Firefox, what Firefox could do. And all of them actually said Firefox DevTools should have the thing that the Chrome DevTools have. Those five new features that the week before Google announced. I know the DevTools team in Google, so I asked them for the click statistics on the DevTools that they have in the browser. And nobody used these things. They just saw that one browser has it, so the other one has to have it as well. And you can, uh, sometimes I think we should just release a browser without any change, and people would probably write, write things, oh, it's faster now, it uses less memory. People believe that the marketing around it is really, really good, and it's simple messages. It's faster, smaller, lighter, better resolution, more colors. And people just basically believe that immediately. We as developers do as well. I call it projection. This is by a quote by Thomas Fuchs on a website uh, that on one of his workshops. And he said, like, let's put this in context. Mobile internet usage has doubled last year. And right now, about 20% of all web traffic in the US is from mobile devices. This means retina screens will soon become the norm. And it's all about retina. Like, is it worthwhile to make your website retina? And I don't get this, because a, a, a number like 20% of all traffic in the US is from mobile devices is to me a bit short-sighted because the web is worldwide. We are not America. We are not the American data that we get from a few mobile providers that tell us, oh yeah, it's mobile traffic, but I didn't even say it's retina devices, it's just mobile traffic, it could be Blackberries. So we'll be like, oh, it's 20%, forget the rest of the web, we don't need to do that anymore, retina is the thing to go. Regardless of the fact that our mobile infrastructure is not built to send images that, that big around, regardless of the fact that the connectivity of your phone is probably not as fast as you think it is. So you might be here with an iPad 3, but you might not have had a lot of fun surfing today if every image would have been retina. But yeah, that's what we do. Like the web is the newest, coolest retina stuff. You don't need to, need to know anything else. And I'm traveling worldwide, and this is a really cool thing to do because you see people that cannot afford a mobile phone, uh, a smartphone, an Android or an iPhone, live in countries where they're not sold or they're not available for the next half year, which annoys the hell out of me. I mean, this is 2012, we shouldn't have to wait for things to be worldwide. 
or actually have no means to actually ever do that because they bought one uh, two months ago which was half a year wage for them so they're not going to update to the next one just because there's better connectivity in the Silicon Valley. So a lot of these features that come out are not worldwide so why should we say this is our job to support that market instead of considering the market that is out there that has a lot of people who are not on the web yet and should be. We have this thing that we're not quite confident as the web developer community because every time something like that is, comes out, we don't stand up and question these numbers or we just get all over it like, oh yeah, now WordPress plugins make everything uh, Retina display. How many WordPress things are being shown? And what is your traffic? Do you have iPad traffic? No, you don't. And this is one of the quotes saying the reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. And we are incredibly good as a web development scene to point out in public what's broken about our technology. You don't hear much about that about the iPhone or native apps. You just say, oh, I made millions with that app. How? Well, I was in the app store. What did you sell? 25 different apps, uh, 250 actually. And all of them are clones of each other, so I made a bit of money with that. But we like, yeah, well, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. We complain more about to each other what doesn't work on the web than actually show things that work and tell about success stories that we had by using web apps, by using the web. So one big thing was this when uh, Mark Zuckerberg had this interview with the vampire at TechCrunch Disrupt. Uh, and this was a big thing the last week in Twitter and everybody's like, oh, Zuckerberg said HTML5 is dead. So this was the big quote that went around. I think the biggest mistake that we made as a company was betting too much on HTML5 as opposed to native because it just wasn't there. The interesting quote that came afterwards wasn't tweeted as much and not much displayed on websites, which was, we actually have more people on a daily basis using mobile web Facebook that we have on using our iOS and Android apps combined. So they have more people using that HTML5 app that was horribly broken and has to be replaced than on the native apps combined. So the other story that was not mentioned much was that, the, uh, that Facebook had built this internal framework called FaceWeb and that was never the quality that they wanted because it was far too early to architect something that around a technology that's still emerging because that was two years ago. So they built something like PhoneGap for themselves that converted HTML to some native bits and some non-native bits. So it was all a mess. There's a new blog post now about the performance of things and why it was bad. But everybody who quoted that was just saying, oh, Zuckerberg said HTML5 is dead, so why do you even bother with that anymore? And I found one thing to make me give me peace of mind, and that was actually not listening to quote and quoting tech press funded by clicks. Blogs like the ones mentioned actually live on headlines that make a lot of clicks and get a lot of comments where people jump on each other's throat and say, like, I love iOS, you love Android, you love web, we all hate each other, it's not gonna be fun. <laughs> so stop quoting this, stop reading it, it's not worth your while. It's the rainbow press of our market. It's the, it's the, the Bild Zeitung, it's the sun of the internet. And it's not worthwhile our time to get aggravated over that. The big mistake that a, few, a lot of companies do, and then they call HTML5 dead, is that they emulate HTML5. They emulate native, uh, native responses and native applications and native methodologies on the web. And this is not what it's about. Web apps are not the same as native apps. They can never be. They come from a totally different background. A lot of people come from engineering into web development and see it as just another software platform. The web is a medium. It's, like, it's more TV, radio than, than, uh, than software. And so many people don't understand that you cannot call something a best practice because it works in C++ or Java and put it on the web and wonder when it doesn't work. And we have all these people getting very excited about this. Every half year there's a new framework that rewrites JavaScript to be class-based. Because obviously that's better to do some simulation in another language to put it into one language. Or replace it with another language and ask every other browser to put it in there. Good luck with that. So there's a dirty little not so secret and it actually stinks. I mean it's good enough but it's actually a bad bad thing. And that is, it's all about the hardware. We can tweak browsers and JavaScript and JavaScript engines until we're blue in the face and the cows come home. In the end, we get locked out by hardware. 
we get locked out by operating systems and we get locked out by, uh, uh, by the hardware providers themselves, so we don't have access actually to the graphics card the way a native app has. We don't have access to swap memory a native code would have. Of course they're going to be faster, much like a Formula One car is faster than a Ford. But finding a, finding a parking lot for a Formula, Formula One car in the middle of the city is going to be quite a tough job. Or having a bumpy road like the web. So, because the problem that people realize that a fruit company from California, uh, one of the first ones, it's cool to sell these hardware, but you make a lot of money with native apps. Far more money than by selling the hardware. Because most of the times the hardware comes, uh, well, not much in, the, in iOS's case, but in Android's case, the hardware comes with a contract and they throw it out really cheaply. But you make money with apps. And then this web thing comes up again. It's like, hey, we can post apps on the web and people could play games by pointing to a URL and having it full screen on the phone and playing it that way. You don't have to go to the app store to have fun on the internet. No, 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 this is not right. So we have basically, the internet is the wheel. The browser and the JavaScript engine is the wheel and the mobile device is the camp right now. So whatever we try to do in the browser and all browsers are working really, really hard to get this done, we're actually hindered by the hardware and the operating system. And in, in Google's case, it's even more interesting because they have the Android browser, which is horrible and needs to die a fiery death as quickly as possible. And then you have, uh, uh, I was at Google I.O. when they announced that finally Chrome is out, out for Android. And I'm like, yes, a good browser on Android. And then they told me, well, the providers of the phones, like the phone companies, can choose to use Chrome or the Android browser. So what do you think we should do? And I'm like, how about Chrome frame for Android? But I didn't get an answer to that. <laughs> so all in all, what we need is drivers. We need hardware drivers, we need access to the metal. We need directly to go from JavaScript to the hardware, and then, we can, then you have a fair comparison. Then you can basically say if a web app is still as slower than a native app, it's a fair comparison, not like a race car and a car that has to go through a herd of cows every single time it tries to access something. And the good news is we're on it. It's called Firefox OS and it's an operating system that actually is built for phones that are very, very low market. We want to reach people that cannot have an iPhone, cannot have an Android phone, but should be on the web because the web is for everybody out there. And I can quickly show you what that, look, what that looks like. You, uh, you remember Stephen Hay saying the command line is not scary. So this is what the command line looks like. It's very simple. It just goes through a few things <laughs> and uh, does a few things and whatever. <laughs> and this is Firefox OS running in, an, uh, in a view just in the, br uh, in the browser right now. So this is what it looks like. You have, a, uh, you have a phone OS, you have your icons, you've got everything that you want. You have your settings, you can have a dialer, you can have your address book. I'll probably crash in the emulator again. But dialer, for example, allows you to use your phone. And that was impossible to do from JavaScript before we wrote all these hardware drivers and wrote the JavaScript APIs on top of it. And if, as a geek, you want to have a phone with ketones, and I want to change these ketones, all I have to do is actually go to the code itself, which one have we opened here, yeah, and I have the frequencies of the different keys defined in JavaScript here. So the operating system is completely written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, the operating system itself, and the apps as well. And, of course, this is fun in an emulator, but it's much more fun to see it running on a phone, so if you want to do that later on as well, we have that here as well. And it's one of those little small phones that if people try to steal it from you, you can throw it at them and they die, and then you can get it back. It's pretty good. <laughs> so, underneath we have all these drivers that actually be wrote for Linux, which is Gonk, the Linux uh, derivative of Android that runs on these phones and then Firefox on top of it and that's it. So we got multi touch, we got web telephony doing calls, web SMS, text messages, geolocation we had for years, battery, web vibration API, which used to be called vibrator API, but it was too, too many silly jokes, so we had to get rid of it. <laughs> Contacts, full screen settings, camera, WebGL, USB and Bluetooth we're working on. So this is live actually from, uh, uh, from Baxilla. So when somebody fixes that, it turns green immediately, and it's on rvmobileapp.com. But that's all by the by, because you're not going to be part of that, but you can if you want to. The code is completely on GitHub, everything is open source, you can use, Git, Kaya, uh, you can use the Gaia interface, which is the HTML interface for yourself. But let's refocus a bit on the web. 
Uh, Darth Vader said that don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. The ability to sell a lot of apps is insignificant next to the power of the web. <laughs> and it really is, because the web is amazing and empowering. I've been hanging out a bit at the Webmaker project that we have running right now, which brings web literacy to people. So we bring people in, or we, we invite people that never have used a computer or the web before. They do exist in hundreds and hundreds. We wouldn't expect that, but they do. And we teach them how to do their first, uh, their first things, to actually do a view source, to find out that the web is made from different components that you can remix, to show developer tools, show them that you can actually right-click on any website and do cool stuff with it, like you can inspect element here, you can do a 3D view and actually see what the page looks like in 3D, and um, if my browser doesn't do it here, that's fine. Like, yeah, you have a 3D view, so this is how deep the HTML goes, rather than just having a normal code display, which is much more boring to people. And how do I get rid of that one? Yeah, wonderful. So, what I find amazing about this is that people uh, get incredibly excited, and you see kids for the first time changing an HTML game and putting their own photo in and doing a jump and run with themselves and then sending it to their friends and sending it to their family and getting very excited about this. So we're doing these code camps all over the world, Facebook as well, we're working with Facebook on that a bit. So um, come to those and find those people that find that excitement that probably got us on the web as well, but we forgot about it. Now, misunderstanding leads to failure. So if you want to make a fake iPhone, it should be a camp recorder. And <laughs> A lot of people make this with web apps. They're like, oh yeah, we're a C++ shop, this is apps, and web apps are the same thing, so where's the MVC framework that we need to use, and where do I buy software to understand what the web is about? When I did my first website, I asked somebody what, is, what to do it with, because I did assembly programming before that, and they were saying, like, oh, you need front page. And I'm like, okay, I couldn't afford this, so I tried to find a pirated version of front page. I didn't find one, so instead I bought an HTML, HTML book. And in the end, it was better, but it was good that this was so expensive. But copying things, that never works that way. The web is based on a few principles, and one of them is communication and collaboration. This is a, a book called New Model Army, which is about an army of mercenaries in England that in the future that actually fight a civil war against the normal army, and they organize themselves via wikis, and actually uh, they don't have any generals or anything like that. Every move that they make is just a vote on a wiki. And people actually talk to each other over IRC with a, with a thing on their arm. And it's, it's a very interesting science fiction army war thing. But it shows that this, this army is completely, uh, really hard to beat by a traditional army that has to wait from commands from top down before they're allowed to actually do something. Or they actually are driven by nationalistic instincts or by racial instincts, whereas the new model army, only, their only instinct is to, to defend democracy and the right to have democratic practices that they have themselves. And this is on the web as well. We communicate and collaborate all the time, and we should not stop doing that. But lately, we're getting into this, like, I'd rather be a rock star than then collaborate with somebody else, so I put something on my blog and hope people come, rather than joining something like Modernizer, or joining a discussion somewhere on GitHub, and getting in through the back door that way. There's also no single point of failure on the internet. And this is a book called Starfish from the Spider that talks about that companies that have a top-down hierarchy, when they get to a certain point and get big, they will actually fall in on themselves. And they will not be maintainable, and they're actually not going to be effective anymore. So spreading them out into smaller companies that are independent and are in competition with each other makes much more sense. And the idea is a spider, if I rip a leg out, the leg is dead and the spider is damaged. A starfish, if I rip a leg out, a new starfish grows out of that leg and the leg gets regrown. And it shows how things like uh, Napster were, were, were possible to shut down because it was one company, but Emule wasn't because nobody knew who wrote Emule, who wrote the software, or which service the stuff was on. So if we spread ourselves around and we actually don't have a single point of failure, we are much, much better, and that's the internet. An app platform where I could download an app from every website out there is much, much better than an app, an app store that will collapse on itself. It's already hard to find apps in an app store right now, and it will just get worse. Because most people make like 400 apps called Talking Dog, Talking Donkey, Talking, ca talking ta uh, Chameleon, and make lots of money with that. And, or it's, it's alphabetical, and if your app is not called at, 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 at
So it's, uh, we, we came up with file system, we replaced the file system and downloading and installing things on desktop with the internet and now we're going back to apps. I just don't get it. And the main thing about the web, it is here and it is beautiful. We have a, we have a distribution platform that is worldwide and everybody is on it and everybody can get on it even with really shitty hardware and really bad connectivity. And it's things that are around there and are beautiful around us. Does anybody know what that is? Sand. sand under a microphone. This is how beautiful sand is. And a microphone, microscope. And <laughs> this is how beautiful sand is. And it's not like it's, uh, it's horrible and just goes into your toes and stuff. It's just really cool if you look into it. It's time to change though. We cannot sit on our laurels and say like, well, we're the web guys. Those, those app stores will die out. Don't worry about it. We're going to do the same things we've done in the past and nothing's going to change. Because we're mainstream now. This is by Gartner and they have this hype cycle thing. The new technology comes out, there's a technology trigger, there's a peak of inflated expectations, a trough of disillusionment and a plateau of productivity after a slope of enlightenment. These are all big words, but what it basically means like people know the web now. You don't go to anybody and say like, I'm a web developer and they're like, whoa. Flying robots and stuff, right? Lasers. <laughs> but if you tell people, I built one of the things that you have on your iPhone, whoa, that is cool, and web guy, yeah, whatever. You know, like I use it for Facebook, I don't use the web. <laughs> and we have to understand that we have, if we're at this plateau of productivity, if we're not hyped anymore, if we don't have the disruption from the media that interferes all the time with us, why are we not productive? Why aren't we there? Why aren't we, uh, we, we just rolling out great web technologies every single day instead of just reinventing the web every single day? And I think the problem is um, that we re have to rethink our tools. That was Leah the other day. I often think that command line editors like VI or Emacs were made by sadists who enjoy making people feel stupid, frustrated and helpless. It's actually because they came from a background where this was the only editor possible on that hardware and that connectivity. But we haven't moved on. We still get very excited about our source code and like, oh, you have to write these 12 commands to get something done, rather than like, here is how the thing works, just use it. We are just not simple enough. <laughs> and iOS, iOS and Android is, here's the SDK, here's your, here's your list view, here's your tab view, go for it, build a cool app. With us, like, yeah, you can use that framework, but it's really not fast enough. You did that framework, but I don't like it. Or you can write from scratch, but you need to be really good about it. That's not how you sell it to somebody who comes into our market. That's how you scare them off. But we're very excited about this. And we, re we keep restating the obvious as well. Like, uh, it's really something to fell off the criminal. And we keep restating how we got into the web, how we got successful with web development. Web standards were there because browsers were completely off kilter. They were just one direction, other direction, and so on. Web uh, uh, semantic HTML and valid HTML was necessary to ensure rendering in the browser that doesn't break apart and or puts like different box models in and these kind of things. We're living in a world where every browser now has the same parser. HTML5 is by definition that much for us and that much for browser makers. Like how a browser that is HTML5 should deal with the things that we write going in. So all the browsers do the same things the wrong way or the right way. There is no ambiguity between the rendering engines anymore. So telling people that, oh well, JavaScript is evil, is not really right anymore because a canvas element makes nothing without JavaScript. But with JavaScript, you can do image manipulation, you can do image upload, you can conversion, you can rip, rip different uh, frames out of a GUI and all kinds of things. So we should be thinking about stating the new things and, and understanding that kids these days, when they come into our market, want cool new things. And not just like, well, write your HTML. No, that doc type has to be uppercase. I'm sorry, that's wrong. And tools help us with that, but we should stop being very excited about the things that got us into the web 10 years ago because we need new cool features that are relevant to the browsers of these days to get people excited. We missed a reboot with HTML5. HTML5 came around and all the semantic fans were all like, yeah, whatever, it's not going to happen, don't worry about it. So the semantics of HTML5 are awful. Well, section, article aside, no browser does anything with those things. 
We have cool new H uh, form fields, but a lot of them don't do anything across browsers or are badly implemented or partly implemented. And we should have been the people that sit on the HTML5 mailing list and say like, here is all the cool new stuff we should have in there that we didn't have before. Instead, HTML5 semantic elements were based on a survey to see what classes people used on their div elements. As most widgets that are necessary for apps were actually done by JavaScript libraries, they didn't have any classes on them. They were just created in JavaScript. I'm actually amazed that we don't have an element called MSO normal, because that's what Word actually does when you say it. This was in my doctor's office, and basically these are not buttons. These are just showing on which floor right now the list is. The only interactive parts are these parts, and that's just wrong. But this is how HTML5 looks to me at the moment as well. There's so many cool things in the HTML that are not quite defined, and a lot of things that I need are not in HTML. I need to still go somewhere else and find those. So we didn't do the right job there. There's a lack of a packaged format, and uh, that means basically when I, when I install an app, I want to have a single file, and that, that can be a jar, that can be an executable, that can be a DMG, whatever, whatever format I have. On the web, it's like an HTML page with 10,000 other files. You find that when you actually send a, an HTML presentation to people. You have to zip them up and give them like 20 folders with JavaScript and CSS and everything rather than one keynote file. A keynote file is also just a folder with lots of files, but the operating system shows it as a keynote file. So we don't have that for HTML5 at all. And unless we have that, there's not going to be any web apps. And I'm sorry, we have, to, we have to agree on one of those. We also have the flight into abstraction. The title of this picture is Death and Fire. Pretty obvious, right? But that's how I feel when I read SAS code. That's how I feel when I read a jQuery plugin, being a guy that knows JavaScript. We, every time we get annoyed with the standards or something not working, we just write another abstraction language that is better than the other stuff that comes with the browser. And then after a few months, we get actually very, very reliant on it. The amount of jQuery I see out there for things that actually JavaScript does, it's, we might as well embed Arial as a web font. Because it's the same kind of like unnecessary code being implemented because people think, I can't do it any other way. So I'm OK with people coming up with better ways of working. Like uh, uh, when I see the Smack stuff or, the, or I see the OOCSS, uh, that's cool. Because it actually shows what we have across browsers and how to work with it professionally. But going into an extra layer of building something cool and new because we don't like what the other one is, this one will not go away. There will not be any jQuery native in browsers ever. This will not happen. Other, uh, other companies invent other languages instead. And you cannot just have water damage in your house and then move up to the first floor because then it's fine again. Don't worry about it. Sooner or later, it will damage the full house. And that's what we do with now. Try to hire a JavaScript developer. People come in like, yeah, I know jQuery, I don't know JavaScript. You are aware that this position was for writing JavaScript inside Firefox, right? Like, yeah, but that's, can I use jQuery for that? No, you can't. <laughs> so it's, don't get excited about these abstractions that they, uh, every few months we have one of those that make us much more product, uh, productive. We should be so productive, we could be on a beach and we could work for a week and throw out 20,000 websites and then go on a beach on holiday. But no, we spend these extra three weeks writing the next abstraction layer to make us even more effective, right? Or we forget about the old one or rant about them online. The myth of portability as well. I talked about this before. HTML is always like, the most portable file format, totally fine. Okay, send it to somebody in an office. They open it in Word and mess it up and save it back to you and something new is in there. HTML is not as portable as we think it is. And again, I'm going to HTML slide decks. I send these out to people and they're like, I looked at it in IE6, it didn't look right and I couldn't do anything with it. And especially when people get very excited about the web being much more portable than these evil closed technologies, and then the first thing on their website tells me you need the latest nightly Chrome to see this website. So when you use HTML5, CSS and JavaScript, and you find that you want one single browser to watch it, you might as well write Silverlight or Flash. Because it's the same problem. You cannot expect end users to have a certain browser or a certain environment. At least with Flash, we gave them that environment and we knew they were in it then. With others, we just like, well, you might download Chrome. No, I can't because I'm on a 56K connection somewhere in the Senegal. And I really only have that browser on this old computer. So we're not as portable as we think we are. 
Does the broken and complex open? Like it's, we're very excited about being engineers and being hardcore about it. And uh, every time I see some cool new open feature, it's a five-step process. Like, oh, this will make you so much more effective. You just need to install Node. You need a Redis server. You need that kind of browser. You probably want to tweak your, your edits or this and that way. And you lose people immediately. If the open alternative is harder to use than the closed one, we need marketing to get people into the open one, and we're not good at marketing. So our open technology should actually be much, much easier to use. That's why when Stephen showed the stuff that he showed with the, with the tools, I said the best would be to put this on a cloud server that people can just go to with a URL and do it there. And that's the kind of things we should be thinking about. Every marketing man out there tells us that the cloud is amazing. We're not using it enough, and we should. Getting back Mindshare, how do we do this? How do we go back? I mean, I've been ranting about what we do wrong right now, and now let's, let's see how we can actually make things better. And uh, I think it's necessary that somebody says something about this, because we're far too excited about talking to each other at conferences and not really reaching the people that should build the next people that come in here. One of the things is a shorter journey time. This is a great, great talk by Brad Mixler called The Maximum Principle. And this is an editor that he showed for a game. So he has the game on the left-hand side, and he has the code of the game on the right-hand side. And he has this time slider up there. And the time slider actually allows him to play the game, and then freeze the game at a certain amount of time. Like this is no screenshot that was of the animation, but this is in the editor. And then change the position of the sprite, so that the jump would be perfect to get that star. And while he's changing the position of the sprite, the code changes for him. Instead of having to go in the code and type in different numbers and finding out what's going there, we take the output and make it the input. And we do that already in a lot of tools. And I think it's much more should be coming like this. This is what tools should, be look like, should look like for building games in the future, or in the near future. Like uh, text editors that highlight automatically when there's a JavaScript error while you're writing your JavaScript. That makes you so much more effective than saving it, finding it in the browser, then finding the error, going back to your editor. Like linting while you type is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And a lot, of develop, a lot of developer tools do that now. The other thing is, of course, developer tools in the browser. Like you can write your whole CSS and JavaScript in the browser already. It's, of course, not as, as good as a, a real editor out there. But it is possible. And it's great to go to a client and instead of telling them, like, this is what your website could look like, just open the developer tools on their live website and mess around with it and say, like, look, if you have that font there, it looks much better. And if, you, if we change that size here, we can do this. You can prototype in the browser with the client with developer tools. But we just see this as this geeky thing for JavaScript guys when they live in their mother's basement and don't know better. So all, every browser nowadays is also a developer tool, and we don't use that enough to you know, advocate it enough to people, because most of the Java and C++ guys I talk to, I don't touch the web because there's no developer stack. I don't have my IDEs, I don't have my libraries, and you're like, well, the display is the developer tool now. We have both in one thing, try to do that in native, good luck. We need building blocks in the browser, and there's a great thing called Web Components, uh, which is a standard uh, from the working group of the W3C, and there's a system called XTag, which is written inside Mozilla. So Web Components work in a, in a, in a nightly build or a cannery in canary uh, in, in Chrome right now, and XTag is a JavaScript library to make this work in all the browsers. So including IE9, so we're thinking about the old people as well. It's pretty good. And this is where it is. Like I can do an X tag box with tabs inside, and it turns into a tab that is interactive, keyboard accessible, thinks about uh, interactivity with, uh, with screen readers and all kinds of things as well. And the toggler box is the same thing here, the X accordion and so on and so forth. The X is because it's actually right now uh, using that library, but the other proposal that we have have a toggler and a tab box. And the cool thing about this one is it's extensible. So we don't have to wait until HTML5 comes up with a new functionality. We can actually write our own tags inside the browser engine. So it's not simulated by JavaScript or anything like that. These togglers and these tabs are native in the browser, not created in the, with JavaScript and all kind of handlers on it. It's using the Shadow DOM that's also used for video players, native video players in the browser. So if you play a video and you wonder what's going on there, you can now right-click it and see what the elements are that the browser created internally for itself. 
And that's the kind of thing you do with that. And we need conversion tools. This is Banana Bread, which is a, uh, a 3D engine uh, conversion from Cube2. Before that, it was called uh, Sauerbraten. Don't ask me why. But this is running in the browser, and it only looks crap because this is actually a badly encoded video. But this runs 80 frames a second on a MacBook Pro right now, and it's a real 3D shooter. And the cool thing about this one is it's not written in JavaScript, and that's what, what you probably would have expected now. But actually what it is, it's a C++, uh, um, C++ shooter that just gets converted to JavaScript called some, uh, with something called mscript. So most game companies we talk to about HTML5 and gaming said like it's never going to happen. We're not going to rewrite our games in a new technology and re-educate all of our developers. But we've got great C++ code, can you do something with us? So we've got a system now to convert C++ to JavaScript and have these kind of high fidelity games in the browser. And that's pretty incredible, and we're working on that to have it on Firefox Mobile as well, so you can play those on Android. Probably going to be a battery nightmare for now, but we're going to fix that as well. And this is important. Instead of just preaching to people and telling them you should do different things, you should learn about the web, you C++ guy that gets millions of dollars a year. Why should you, you should do this? We have a conversion tool for you. We, we actually get you on the web with what you want to do. And tools in general are thinking is the next big thing. So before you think of redesigning your blog, before you think about making another 3D CSS transformation demo, partner with a developer, find somebody else, and think about how to make a tool to make the same thing happen. And a great thing that's happening right now is brackets from Adobe. Yes, the evil Adobe that gave us Flash and other diseases. <laughs> they have a developer tool out now that is called Brackets, which is, an HTML, uh, which is a code editor that is written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So when I open this editor on my computer, it actually has its own code as the first example in there. So you can recode, re, uh, recode your editor inside itself, which is a bit of a thing to get, get your head around. But it's incredible if you think about it, because I can host that on my, brow on, my, uh, on my server and I go to a client and use that directly on the client side instead of just having my editor with me all the time. I can put it on a memory stick if I wanted to and I can open it in the browser. And the cool thing about that one is that Adobe open sourced the thing. It's on GitHub. They ask people to actually help them make it better. And we should do that. We shouldn't say like, oh, this evil corporation now just wants our cheap labor and help them out with their editor that's half-baked. But they actually put a hand out and say like, guys, do you want to do some stuff with us? And we shouldn't complain and wait for the last Photoshop if we could help them to build something web-based together with them because they want to. So the time is now and the place is here. Uh, there's this wonderful quote in Sean Tan's The Lost Thing called, today is the tomorrow you expected yesterday. We always talk about the tomorrow, and we don't think about like what happened that it's not here yet. So let's not wait any longer and just do things and collaborate and listen and work with people and get the web out there rather than waiting for somebody cool on stage to release something that we can use. You all have the talent, you're just too shy to actually collaborate on it and make something cool together. And we have the tools. Even if you don't want to code, we need writers, we need people to document things, we need people to, find, to give explanations that are simple. Mozilla Developer Network that I work for, that probably all of you learned JavaScript from, is, an, is a wiki. If you don't like something there, don't tweet to me about it. Hit that edit button and fix it. And we'll be thankful. Your name will be under it automatically when you edit something. You will, you will get the credit and we don't take it away from you. HTML5 rocks from Google. Move the web forward from, uh, from a few, few people like um, Paul Irish. Opera Odin as well. And of course, Mashing Magazine. All of those need writers, and a lot of them pay them as well. You can make an extra $200 by writing a cool article that you could also put on your blog and nobody finds it there. So that's possible. <laughs> and complain where people listen. I, I, I get daily, I get people complaining to me about some random thing in Firefox that they don't like. So my job would be to go to Bugzilla, find, uh, find Firefox, enter their bug without knowing what happened that made that problem happen, and then hope that somebody answers me, so I answer that person on Twitter. That's not effective. Um, uh, uh, Divya wrote a really good article about how all the different browsers are available and how you can file bugs to them. The developers of browsers in every company out there only look at their bug queue. They don't look on Twitter to see if somebody complains about something. They have these many bugs to work through. 
So add to this pile because they're working through those. Don't just complain on the web that Firefox should do this or Chrome should do this. That's great, but nobody's going to go to your blog and find that randomly and then say, like, oh, it's a really good idea, thank you so much. I'm now going to spend three weeks on that rather than fixing the 205 bucks that I already have. So just file a bug. I know it's painful. As somebody who is graphically inclined, looking at Bugzilla is not fun. But it's necessary. And sadly enough, there's no better tool in place for a lot of companies out there. And company, probably in your company, you have some bug trackers as well that are pain to use. Maybe that's the next tool we should build, a good bug tracker that doesn't look like crap. <laughs> so collaborative coding and styling is another big thing. A lot of people put things on their blog and then say, like, oh, why doesn't that work? Because anybody can tell me in the comments if that happens. But we have Dropbox, we've got the Cloud9 IDE, which is a full IDE in the browser, connected with GitHub already. We have JSPIN, JSPIN, CodePen, Dablet, Tinker.io. There's lots of tools where I can actually make a case and, and code it, and then go out to Twitter and say, like, can anybody tell me why this is wrong? And people would go there, fix it for you, and you've, you're done. A lot of the stuff in this slide deck looks better because I put a, 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 I put a JS fiddle out and ask people, why doesn't that do it? And they're like, okay, it's like this. And then I had a, a fiddle, got my code back, done. I could have had a 20 minutes conversation on email with that person, but just talking through the code and fixing it together made it so much more easy for us. And catching them while they're young is very important as well. Children need to be taught how to think, not what to think. There's a great tool called Mozilla Symbol, which is an, an, a, an HTML editor to one side and a rendering on the other side. And we, we teach kids HTML with that because we have things like a broken map of, of the internet and it shows you actually the code. Well, heck, let's just, no, not online. Um, <laughs> it actually shows you the HTML code and errors in it. And when you go to that line, it explains in, in English or it's also going translated what that error means. And when you fix these errors, the, the thing on the left, on the right-hand side gets better and better the more you fix. So instead of asking people to start writing their first code from scratch, we ask them to debug their code from scratch, which is much easier but also much more rewarding. And it's a wonderful tool also to go to clients and show them quickly something, how something can work in HTML. Because they see immediately what you're doing and what the explanations about it is. Udacity uh, pays people for video, uh, uh, for video intro introductions or video tutorials that then get used in high schools in America and in Brazil as well. Code Academy is another one. Change Edu is a, is a website about changing education worldwide about this. And Khan Academy, of course, there's no excuse anymore nowadays of saying I don't know something. We've got the internet. You can learn something if you just look around instead of just looking at Facebook all day. Or maybe in Facebook you can learn stuff as well. It's just this, this wonderful, wonderful thing that we have there and we're not using it enough. And I think education is the next big bit because everybody who comes into the web development world with a computer science degree needs to re-educate it for the first half year. I sometimes want to put them in a room and like put like lights on them and stuff or whatever. It needs to reset them. But it's just really impossible to explain to some people, no, this is not how it works. We don't have a pattern for that. We just make it work. So focus on the great things and tell their story. So we're always good at complaining about what we do and how broken our things are. And just think of this movie. Would you go and watch it? Let's watch that movie, the one where a wife and all but one children of a family are brutally murdered, the last child gets kidnapped, and the father starts a desperate attempt to find it, uh, to find it with his only ally being a mentally challenged woman. Anybody seen that? You've all seen it. It's Finding Nemo. <laughs> but this was not on the DVD as the explanation what that movie is about. So let's stop selling the web to people that way and our job to people that way. And that's all I had, so thanks very much.